Do you have a view on the dollar? Do you see it strengthening further? I do see it strengthening further. Everything I've said so far would suggest a strong dollar. Uh, as you know, exchange rate forecasting is probably the most difficult thing of all to the big liquid deep markets. Uh, but there are rare occasions when the dollar becomes really quite forecastable and it is a credit event. It's a situation where the world starts to de-gear. In a world of rising gearing, what happens is people, many people in the world tend to borrow dollars. Now they may use that to fund uh, you know, investments in India, they may use it to fund uh, construction projects in Turkey, they may use it right across the emerging markets. But when we have a credit issue, when credit becomes less available or people wish to repay it to reduce the risk, the net position is a buying of the dollar as people move back and pay off those liabilities. So if we are looking at Turkey, uh, I think going into de facto default through the imposition of exchange controls, I think we're looking at a de-gearing event. Uh, it'd be very, very rare for the dollar to go down in that scenario. And then just once again to refer back to Jay Powell, he did make a very clear statement that if these things begin to happen, it's none of his business. Now, if, if he continues with that, the dollar could go uh, very high and very sharply higher in, indeed. Uh, there, the two other major currencies in the world, I think, have unique problems. Japan has a unique problem that it has no savings left to fund its government, so its central bank is, and over the long term, that's always been bad for exchange rates. And in Europe, we obviously still have this problem that the, the fiscal integration slash political integration of Europe has really hit a roadblock. And it's difficult to see how a single currency functions unless progress can be made on that integration. And yet, Italy is the latest poster child. It seems that the people are voting to go a different direction, away from integration, towards greater independence and sovereignty. It's very difficult to be bullish on the euro. On the euro. So the dollar almost by default because of what's happening in the other two, but specifically because of a credit event, it has always spiked the dollar higher. Mm. Where does this leave emerging markets? Because usually the two move in opposite directions. Yeah, it I mean, it is really sad that they're lumped together, I should say that. I mean, the fact that policymakers in Turkey have made some dreadful, dreadful mistakes, why should that you know, have any impact whatsoever on India, China or anywhere else? Uh, unfortunately, it does because the capital flows are lumped together. So, for instance, there are lots of emerging market bond funds and emerging market equity funds. And, and if they start getting redemptions, then it is kind of pulled pro rata almost from all of emerging markets. So emerging market risk has been pushed down to very low levels. Uh, I think Jay Powell is wrong. I think it's been pushed to very low levels by his monetary policy, by the fact that US interest rates are so low. Uh, so I think for all emerging markets, we'll see the risk premium reset. Uh, I know you're gonna ask me about India in this context, but you know the, the ones where, the, where there should be the massive reset are the ones where the politics are really just completely in the wrong place. Uh, and I would pick out Turkey, but there's lots of others like the Philippines, uh, like Hungary, uh, I would say even potentially Poland. Uh, there's a big election coming up in Mexico in October and politics could go completely to the wrong place. And what I mean is the, the kind of old politics uh, of more control, uh, restrictions, restrictions on markets. Uh, that's the dangerous populism for investors. Now, I don't see any of that in India, and I realize people watching may have a different opinion, but I see the current political setting in India, even if growth slowed, I don't see the, polit the current political setting being pushed off course. And this is, this is what are going to be a very, very important test now for all emerging markets. How do you respond if there is another downdraft? And I think the politics of India are such that it will pretty much keep to the same track but there are other places in the world that would probably go a different direction. How do you see India's macro setting now? I, well, I see it as very positive. I mean, I look at interest rates which have gone up, but they're still low by historical standards. Inflation is low by historical standards. Money supply growth is low by historical standards. Current account deficit, low by historical standards. Uh, the ability to attract capital, which I think is the absolutely crucial thing, seems to be very good and can go higher. So I wouldn't even worry if the current account deficit got bigger. I think the policy settings are attracting capital. You know, it's, it's strange for me to relate that when I started in this business, the Berlin Wall came down. And what we all knew instantly was that, it, that all these new emerging markets that were open for business were going to have to run huge current account deficits because they're going to have to attract a lot of capital. You know, they didn't have large savings, so they're going to have to use other people's savings. And as the current account and the capital account were mirror images of each other. And then what actually happened, particularly for someone like China, they ran a huge current account surpluses and the whole thing didn't make any sense. So we're kind of preconditioned to believe that a, a large current account deficit is necessarily a bad thing for an emerging market. But a country of the size of India, 
if it can genuinely attract capital, which has been the country's problem for, you know, for, for many decades. But if that has genuinely changed now, then the country can be much more stable going forward. I would, I would stress, and I think uh, uh, if you get a chance to chat to Rajan, you should really ask him about this. The key thing is to get long-term capital and not the portfolio capital. And it seems to be India is doing a good job at both. So the more of this long-term capital comes, comes along, actually many of the historic issues that India has had uh, become less and less important going forward. I mean, there's many other things I think are going well in India, which is uh, obviously we have issues with the banking system, uh, but at least there are private sector banks in India who are doing a better job. That's not true in places like China. So I remain very optimistic long term about India. I find myself embarrassed because I always say that and then I say don't buy the stock market. And I, I find difficulties with the valuation in the stock market. We're looking at an emerging market problem coming along. Uh, India will be caught in the downdraft but not as badly as others. Uh, that is a buying opportunity for long-term investors. If you had to, you know, if I was asked to put money anywhere in the world for the next 10 years, I wouldn't hesitate to buy Indian equities on that time frame. Uh, so macro isn't always connected to the stock market. Uh, in fact, we can show there's 117 years of data for returns from it's nearly 20 stock markets across the planet now, and we can see there's virtually no relationship between GDP growth and the return you get from equities. And that's because the valuation varies so much, and if you pay the wrong price for equities, you can still get it wrong in the long run. You know, the economy's been doing well, but the market hasn't done so well. So cautious on the market, but not cautious on the macro settings for, for India. And this, this transformation in foreigners' willingness to invest in India can bring many, many things into line for you know, very good outcomes. And long, long may it continue. Mm. Let me ask you, I mean, it's a difficult question, but since you are predicting an EM crisis, a looming EM crisis, what's your best guess of the timing. Do you see it happening in 2018? I mean, if you had to guess, would you say it might happen this year? Yes. I mean, the reason I would say that is because it seems to me that Turkey is already on the verge of default. So it's not forecasting that this will happen in Turkey. It is happening as we sit here. As you know, the president has called a snap election for 24th of June. Uh, I believe that if he can make it that far and if he gets re-elected, he will then take fairly extreme measures to shore up Turkey which will, uh, would, would constitute, in one form or another, exchange controls and would have an instantaneous impact on capital flows to all emerging markets. So normally I would say to you I couldn't possibly forecast, but on this occasion I'll say 24th of June. Is there any chance in your eyes that the long U.S. growth cycle that we've seen for the last many years, both from an asset quality, I mean asset price point of view and from an economic point of view, that's beginning to come to an end and you, you could even think of a U.S. recession a year or two down the line? Yeah, I mean, it's, certainly, I mean, it's possible, and you know the statistics for how long, on average, these, these expansions have lasted, and this is already a very long expansion, if a very uh, shallow one, not a very, not a very robust one. So it could really, I mean, it could end at any time. The, I think, what can I say? There, there are very few ways you can forecast a US recession. Obviously, an inverted yield curve is the number one one, historically. People argue now whether the yield curve is as indicative of true economic conditions as it used to be. But I think we'd all be foolish to ignore the yield curve. So one of the things, rather than forecast it, is say, what should you look at? So look at the yield curve. I'm personally forecasting that the 10-year the, uh, yield isn't going up. So that means you could have an inverted yield curve really quite soon, given on what Jay Powell is bent upon doing. And then we'd have to consider this. Uh, the reason I'm being a little bit cautious about all of this, and perhaps more cautious than usual, is thinking back to the late 1990s. We had this emerging market issue. Crisis, I think, is too strong a word. I think we, some countries have crisis, but we just, it's a downgrading of growth for emerging markets, which is not the Asian crisis. It's not something like that. But when it happened last time, America imported deflation. Interest rates stayed fairly low and growth in America stayed fairly high. And the whole, if you like, I think you could say, with the benefit of hindsight, that the whole economic cycle was extended by the emerging market crisis. Uh, you know, the central bank was on hold, actually cut rates in 1998. So I'm a little bit concerned now that we're on the verge of this event in emerging markets that could that extend this cycle? Once again, there's a difference between extending an economic cycle and saying the stock market's going up. That is, that is a very different thing. But extending this economic cycle actually could be a side effect of something of a lower growth, lower inflation outlook for emerging markets. Russell, on that note, thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you. you.